So, um, almost, almost, um, almost home and dry. <laughs> Talking of bigger boats. Um, so, this session, um, we, we um, called it a keynote conversation. So instead of having papers, instead of having another brilliant paper, you know, we had a fantastic opening plenary by Ruth, and then a wonderful um, plenary last night um, from Marina Warner, and we decided that towards the end, rather than having another full plenary, we would um, have, indeed, a conversation. So we're going to start a conversation from up here, but it's very much a conversation we want to open up to you. It's also a conversation that is ongoing, really, because we, we started this conversation where I feel a long time ago, but, but formally um, we started this conversation with, with an additional member of the panel, with, with Anthony Tamburi as well, at um, Toronto University um, a couple of years ago, um, much closer to the beginning of the project, um, of the TML project, uh, when we were there for the um, Italian American Studies Association conference, and we had a round table about what we were planning to do. I don't know whether we've done that, we've done lots of things and we'll continue to do things, but, um, but let me start formally by saying, okay, um, I have two people here on the stage with me who really do not need introductions, but as always, it's a rhetorical gesture, so I'll say they don't need introduction and then I will introduce them. Um, so I have Donna Gabaccia, Professor Donna Gabaccia, is Professor of History at the University of Toronto, indeed. And I mean, I think all I can say about Donna, and, and her work has been mentioned already a number of times um, uh, uh, throughout the conference, is that, well, her work on Italian diasporas, but also her work on the cultures of migration has really opened up the whole field for so many of us in this room and, and well beyond this room. Um, and then I have uh, Professor Fred Gardafe on the other side and, and Fred who is Distinguished Professor of English and Italian American Studies at Queen's College, CUNY and also uh, one of the leading lights of the, the Calandra Institute in New York which is one of our partners in the, in the, uh, the project. Um, and again, is someone who's made such a difference in, in shaping the present and the future of, of Italian American studies in particular. And we thought they're two ideal people with whom to continue, as I was saying, not start, but continue a dialogue on what does it mean to think um, our subject, our field, whatever that field we might decide to call it, um, transnationally. Um, and I don't want to speak for a long time. The format's going to be, I'm, I'm going to say a couple more things and then I'm going to um, pass this mic first to Donna and then to Fred, um, who will speak for a few minutes, but then we will open it up to you and it will be really a, a conversation. But what I wanted to say is that well, it's been um, an amazing three days. Um, I think it's, it's the, I think you'll agree with me, the buzz around these rooms. You know, people kept saying to me, this is a party. You know, um, there is a real atmosphere, a really positive atmosphere, and I have to say, I have heard, uh, I have listened to some of the most exciting papers that I've listened to for a long time, um, and you know, and I've listened to some of the most exciting research in Italian studies in a very broadly understood um, sort of way, um, which have. You know, which have really given me a buzz as well. And there is an excitement about what we're having, what, what we're doing. And yet, at the same time, um, individually and as we're talking, we're all saying um, that, that very often we find ourselves having to justify why. Why should we, you know, be doing Italian studies? What does it mean to do, or even modern languages more broadly? You know, why, why is our discipline needed? What is the specificity of what we do? What's our significance? Why should we, and why do we, if we manage, attract students to, to study our subject? Um, and there are certain things I think that, that, that I want to ask. For instance, you know, a question that was coming up earlier with, when Takwa was speaking. What is Italian literature? Is what she does Italian literature? How many of our colleagues would, outside this room would say that's Italian literature and how many would say it isn't? That's a question I'm very happy to pick up and to run with here. Um, there are other questions that I'd rather not not want, you know, or, or other other images that I don't want to um, don't want to 
deal with the, or, 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 or I don't want to adopt again. So, for instance, you know, I don't want, um, and I think there is a risk, and, and I'd, I'd rather say it, I suppose I'm trying to find a way to, to say what I don't want to say or to not say what I want to say. I don't know. Um, but one, one thing that I suppose we could be accused of is to, to have yet another version of that. Um, you know, we, we had some fantastic um, papers at the very beginning talking about um, the history of um, Italians in the world and the way in which, for instance, have been constructed you know, by the fascists at one point and then by subsequent Italian governments. And this, this whole idea of a grande Italia, you know, I don't think what we're doing here is about proposing some other way in which, oh no, you know, Italian culture is actually global and we are leaders in whatever. I don't want this to be about some form of made in Italy sold to the world. So there are certain things that I think we can we can deal with and, and others that we should deal with in, in, the, in another sense. Um, there's been also, and, and, and it was returning again in the previous session, there's been a lot of discussion, whether in this room or in the seminar room or in the corridors, about what it means to be more generally an academic or, or academics, in particular academics, I think in the humanities today, and academics in the humanities with a transnational um, a profile and a transnational outlook on what we do. And so what is our role in terms of, um, you know, what we do as educators, what we do as activists, what we do in terms of reframing and reshaping our fields and the curriculum that we teach, what we do in terms of collaboration and co-production of, of research and, and, and of other um, uh, artifacts that, that may go out there, what is the impact of what we do? So I think those are questions that, that, that are important to us and that, that are important as we look not just backwards, and I'm mindful of what Marina was saying yesterday, um, you know, the art of memory cannot be just about looking backwards or being constrained by certain narratives. Memory has to be, and, and, and the way in which we work has to be about how we construct the future. And that, um, you know, Luci Calipari Marcuzzo is, is, is um, um, so beautifully, again, represents that. Um, that is also about the desires, the desires that come to us from the past and that push us towards the future. So um, I think we can talk about all of those things here. And I hope that you will intervene, but first, with some historical memory and some sort of uh, looking towards the future, um, Donna. Thank you. It's really terrific to be here, to have watched this project evolve and um, reach this amazing uh, kind of expression here this week. Um, so I wanted to pick up on two maybe tropes or maybe metaphors that have persisted, at least across those parts of the program I've been able to attend. The first is, of course, memory, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a little exercise in connect connecting past of a scholarly field to the present. But the other is fiber. <laughs> and. Uh, weaving and tapestries and textiles. I can't do my fiber work while I talk to you, but I, once I put this aside, <laughs> I'll get back to it. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to talk about this metaphor, but by doing it while I talk my memory work, I want us all to come away from our conversations thinking about why that became such a prevailing um, uh, metaphor and image and uh, thread, if you will, across the program. I think it's significant and I think actually it points a way forward, but at the moment I'm just thinking that kind of with my bodily actions rather than with my head, but the future will be a product of both of those, I think. So, memory work, memory work um, as one of the older members on the program. Let me just take you back 25 years uh, to the years around 1990 when uh, I had completed a dissertation and a second book on uh, Sicilian migrations uh, and was thinking about my last work on Italy and was thinking of at that moment in the early 90s uh, doing a comparison of Italians in labor movements, not just in Sicily and or Italy and the United States, but in all of the many places that I knew 
through earlier experience and travels had attracted Italian workers. And um, it was a unique moment when I started to talk to people about the project that eventually became, we called it Italians Everywhere, sometimes we called it Italian Workers of the World, we called it a variety of things. But when we started that project, um, it wasn't something that easily found either acceptance or enthusiasm. In fact, as we looked for funding to support us, we were repeatedly told, you can't compare Argentina and the United States. You can't possibly have a dialogue between those who study Australia and France or the Maghreb and uh, 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 Brazil. Being foolish and younger and more energetic, we said, why not? We lived at a time when globalization theory was in various forms, making its mark on my own discipline of history. For example, I began teaching world history at around the time that I uh, began uh, pulling together the collaboration that became my diaspora's books and a number of collections of essays on workers and uh, uh, women and, and gender and ultimately family and intimacy with uh, Australian anthropologist Loretta Baldassar, how I wish she were here too. Uh, globalization theory was also playing out in sociology. It was having its impact in cultural studies. And as an historian, the discovery of Nina Glick Schiller, the theorization of transnationalism resonated in very powerful ways for me. History is not a theorizing discipline, but my empirical work on Italian migrations had forced me already in the 70s and 80s into what I called a transnational methodology. If I wanted to start where migrants started in their home villages, not notably Sambuca di Sicilia in southwestern Sicily, and follow them where they went, I had to, as a historian, as a researcher, examine archives in multiple languages, multiple sites. And as I began to imagine comparisons that were broader than just Sicily and Elizabeth Street, and to imagine a work that would look at Italians more globally in many lands, I was not only responding to the intellectual imperative to uh, think on a larger scale and to embrace or at least critique uh, new paradigms and methodologies, but I was also forced to confront something that very few people in my discipline did, which was collaborative work in multiple languages, right? What model of collaboration could we find that was not the model of the sciences, of the laboratory, of the chief researcher, whose name was always the first author, and then the smaller people who did all the work in the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth author position. And so, together with Fraser Ottonelli, uh, Franco Iacovetta, and a number of colleagues in about eight different countries around the world, we made up a collaborative process. And that act of collaboration, that act of responding to multilingualism, to the many genres in which we as historians and social scientists and cultural studies scholars write, uh, in a small way, I think, pushed me forward into the 21st century as, to my amazement and pleasure, more and more colleagues joined in thinking about these alternative ways of doing scholarship. And that brought me uh, in the 90s to Ruth Ben-Ghiat, who was my colleague in North Carolina, and ultimately to the Warwick group, uh, whom I met in uh, 2008. It brought me to Loretta Baldassar and to many of the scholars on the Italian diasporas in uh, countries around the world. So there's both a story of impossibility and resistance and 
kind of shock and horror as people responded to my little ideas in the early 1990s into an explosion of enthusiasm and resistance and a proliferation of paradigms, the transnational, the global, the diasporic. We can go on and on and on. Um, but the embodiment of that research through collaboration, I think, is what will carry us much further into the 21st century as our intellectual uh, agendas uh, inevitably uh, change the social relationships that shape those intellectual agendas will be, I believe, formative. So thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> I have three basic areas that I want to address. Um, and, and I will, in some of each of those areas, echo things that Donna has said. I want to talk about where Italian American studies came from, uh, where it is, and where it is going. Um, Italian American studies, for most scholars in the field, and most of the scholars of Italian American studies, although that's not true as much now as it used to be, uh, are Italian Americans themselves. So it starts from the self. It starts what happens when you go to graduate school and you're studying African American and Jewish American and Asian American. And just like Spike Lee in uh, Do the Right Thing, when he's working in a pizzeria and the walls of the pizzeria are filled with pictures of people who come from pizza land, and yet the people who are eating the pizza are all African Americans. He asks Danny Aiello, where are the bros on the wall? And when I was at the University of Chicago, uh, I asked the same question. And if it wasn't for Rebecca West, I would have been thrown out. Um, and uh, so the Italian department tried to rescue me from doing uh, this uh, thesis on Italian-American writers. I had originally began as a Whitman scholar. Uh, Whitman who embodies everything, right? I am everybody. I am all America, except he didn't have any Jews in Leaves of Grass, but that's another story. The, uh, it begins with, with what happens to the self, and I think migration begins that way. Uh, so Italian-American studies begins with, start, you know, starting from the self. Gramsci tells us we all need to do this, critics need to do a self-inventory. And when you don't see yourself in what people call culture, you need to challenge that absence with a presence. Um, I had a long conversation with an African-American actress many, many years ago who said that whenever she looked into the media, she never saw herself. Or if she did see herself, it was in a position that she never would have wanted to be in, uh, whether it was as a maid or a prostitute or, or what. And she said, when you don't see yourself, in a, in a cultural mirror, you begin not to exist. And I began thinking about that a little bit more, especially in terms of Italian Americans. And I realized that if you don't see yourself in the cultural mirrors, you are, in a sense, a vampire. And what you do is you feed off identities of others, which is precisely what happened, I think, to Italian Americans. Um, in the space of the other, you want to ask the question, where is the self? Um, and you begin to look in places like wherever Italian Americans begin to appear. So if on the front page of a New York Times book review is an article by Gates Elise with the question, where are the Italian American novels? And you're a young scholar in Italian American culture and you know there are many, many novels and Gates Elise knows there are no, believes there are none, you realize that John Battista Vico was right when he says, ignorant men make themselves the measure of all things. So you begin to think, and this is exactly what happens, I think, sometimes with, with scholars who are ignorant of a particular area. They begin to think that they are the center of the, of the measure of what is good, what is aesthetically good, what is aesthetically bad, and so on. So this is kind of how Italian American studies begins. And it begins in a very parochial way. It begins almost like a hobby for most of the scholars. It wasn't really anybody who could call themselves a professor of Italian-American studies. Um, and then as, as the field begins to grow, it stagnates. Uh, and for me, that was a long period of stagnation, uh, where 
Italian American scholars begin feeding off each other, quoting each other, reading, you know, sometimes reading each other, most of the times not reading each other, um, and not interacting with other groups. And, and my areas of interaction came within the United States. I would interact, I, I became very much involved with Malus, multi-ethnic literature of the United States. So I had read the Asian American literature. So I, be, I began to look at the American experience as a kind of multi-dimensional, multicultural experience and comparing Native Americans, for example, uh, to Italian Americans and so on, which people will say, well, how could you possibly do that? And if you begin to look at, there's, there's, a, there's an incredible comparison when you begin. And when you start doing this comparative work, it scares the hell out of the scholars who are deep in whatever field they're in and, and, and deep in their methodology. Because as Donna says, it requires, if not physical collaboration with others, you know, collaboration with others' ideas, which you absorb through reading. It means you have to constantly be reading and exploring. Um, where the stagnation begins to end is when Italian American studies rears up and, and realizes, you know, we're not the measure of all the Italian experiences in the world. And it, it, it kind of woke up a lot once uh, I was invited to Warwick um, by Laura Donna many years ago. I don't know how long ago that was. Um, and, and we began to look at this. And I began to think of uh, this, this migration experience as a diaspora, but I didn't dare use the, use the word diaspora because it was, remain, it was reserved for you know, the Jewish experience and, and maybe the Armenian uh, uh, migration. But as we began to use it more and more, um, you know, working more and more with, with uh, international people and, you know, you know, Donna says she doesn't like followers, but, you know, seeing what she was doing, reading the work that she was doing, even though it didn't relate directly to my field, it, 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 it informs the way I began to look at things in terms of the, the various migrant experience of Italians who traveled throughout the world. So this, this is where we're at now. Uh, where we, requires the recovering of language. You know, I always tell the story of when my, when I started, when I went to Italy, I spoke a dialect which the old, only the old people understood and they laughed at me because they would say, you're too young to speak so old. Uh, I went to Venice and, and I thought I was speaking Italian and he said, would you like to speak English, sir? And I said, no, I'm speaking, he says, you, you sound like you're from Mars. I don't, I don't know. <clears throat> and then when I finally learned Italian, through the help of people like Elisa Weaver and Rebecca West when I was at the University of Chicago. Uh, I go back and speak to my grandmother in Italian. She answers me in English. And my uncle says, you know, I, I went to my uncle. I said, how come every time I speak to grandma, and I finally learn Italian. And uh, he says, don't tell her I told you this, but she says you sound like a priest. <laughs> and I, so I had no idea of what standard Italian had done to my grandmother's psyche uh, until I began studying that. And so recovering the language was so important and that's one of the hard things to knock into the heads of Italian American scholars is the importance not only to be able to read and write scholarly things about it but to, uh, to speak to people. Uh, and not just to speak to other academics but to speak to people um, at, at, all, at all levels of society. And this relearning the language and the, this notion of, of Italian diaspora has revitalized Italian American studies. Um, we've created the summer program for uh, graduate students and, and uh, young PhDs, anybody really who's interested um, it, with the University of Calabria. We've tried to knock on the doors of graduate programs, uh, especially within our own CUNY, and it's, it's been very hard to work politically. But I think with the University of Calabria and with the Calandra Institute, we've been able to create this program, which we have called the Italian, uh, the Summer Seminar in Italian Diaspora Studies. So for three weeks, we have scholars uh, who are in their field, whether it's, uh, well, we're looking for South American scholars, so if you know of anybody who's interested, let me know. Um, and, and we bring 20 uh, graduate students and, and uh, you know, 
recent docs to uh, Calabria to, to work together. Uh, and, and one of the elements that I teach is a, a seminar, a workshop seminar, where they actually take projects and they work together and we do build collaborations. Um, so that's, that's one of the ways it's kind of manifested itself today. Um, this idea of, a, of, of transnationalism has opened up by necessity this comparative uh, methodology which requires us to understand post-colonial work that's being done, especially by um, Christina Lombardi and, and um, my... Uh, <laughs> Katarina, no, Katarina, I, I know, but... Um, it requires us to know uh, different ethnicities. It requires us to understand terrorism. You know, the United States thinks terrorism, you know, existed just in, in 2001. I mean, terrorism in the, is as old as the United States is. People are always trying to blow up the United States from the inside. Um, it, 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 it requires us to understand racism from all different perspectives. And class, especially class. The one thing, and this is the thing I'm going to leave the, 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 where we are today with, is if you look at the, or at the, the first line of the Italian constitution, uh, Italy is a republic founded on work. You know, where you can find work today is very difficult in Italy, but that at least is the Constitution. The first line. If you look at the United States Constitution, the word work never exists. It's not at all in the Constitution. And the word labor exists only in a clause which enables a proprietor or an owner of a laborer to chase that person down if they break the contract. That's it. Labor doesn't exist. Yes, we have the pursuit of happiness, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but it says nothing about work. So if you do a little transnational study there, you begin to see where this happens. And, then, and then, then it would bring you back in the United States to stories like Shea's Rebellion, which nobody ever studies because it was one of a, a very dangerous rebellion that happened in the United States. So class is a very important thing that we're beginning to look at. Now, where do we go from here? Well, we need to institutionalize this. It's not enough that scholars like Donna and I do this and then our work is there and, and so on. We need to institutionalize this. And this is probably the, the last segment of my career will be devoted to this institutionalizing, both in, in, in academia and in what the people outside, inside academia for some reason call the real world, but I, I for some reason can't separate them. So that means we need to find our way into departments. Right now, the English department doesn't want us, the Italian department doesn't want us, but the Italian departments are beginning to see, thanks to people like Ruth, <laughs> that there's no, it's all a part of the same study. Um, whereas in the past, they, you know, oh, Italian-American studies, well, you should go into English, it's American studies. I was in the English department, they said you should go into the Italian department. Even today, I, I, I actually belong to both departments which means I have to go to both meetings and so on. It's, it's much more work than, than you'd ever want it to be. Um, and it's, it's going to require much more um, opportunities to, be, to do collaborative work um, and the methodologies of which, of course, as Donna said, need to be invented. Uh, and then, what, you know, what do we do when we go to these conferences? Well, we get to interact with people. I mean, this, I was speaking with, um, Paolo Baratti at um, the, the Italian Museum in, in Melbourne, uh, who I met in Macerata at a conference. And over the time, we, we decided, he said he would like to do a conference in Melbourne on, on uh, Italian diaspora studies. We're going to see how that goes. And then he said, well, then Anthony Tambori said, well, then we'll do the next one at Calandra Institute. And then they have a third one that they would like to do in Prato because I think there's a University of Australia that has a seat. Monash. Okay. So right now there's this idea floating around about kind of extending the kinds of things we're doing here further. Um, but and that all needs to be laid down. But that's some of the things that we're looking at to do in the future. But again, the idea is to um, institutionalize these in the sense that make people begin to think diasporically, because 
<laughs> it's one thing to think globally and act locally, or act locally, or think locally and act globally, whatever. But it's another thing to understand these experiences. And I think because of the historical work that Donna and her group has, begin, has done in the past, and the work that's being done at this particular conference. And, and the last thing I want to leave you with is it's, it's important. It's very hard for one person to be kind of a diasporic scholar. But when you put, like the next issue of the Voices of Italian Americana, which we just finished, which will be out in November, uh, is our first issue on Italian diaspora, our first attempt to do an Italian diaspora issue. And I realized as I edited the volume that it's the reader who will come away from reading these articles and the ideas that come into their head that will create these kind of diasporic methodologies as opposed to, you know, we have an article about a, an Italian uh, woman writer in Argentina. We have a an article about um, uh, Italians in uh, New Zealand uh, and Italians in uh, Italian advertising in the United States and so on. But it's the reader who will then look at these different articles and begin to formulate ideas which I think will then contribute to creating this kind of diasporic thinking, which, which brings us closer together. It, it's certainly one of the first things we ever did when we studied Italian-American studies, and, and, and by defense we had to, is we had to say how we were different. My, my scholars, uh, the, the professors I work with, they said, well, what's Italian about, what's Italian-American about American literature? And the Italian professors would say, well, you're just putting all these American writers in a ghetto. You know, you're doing them a disservice by looking at them as Italian-American. And, and the, I think the way to transcend that is to begin to look at, what about the writers in South America? What about the writers, in Italian-American writers in Brazil? And the other thing, as Donna said, that requires is that you know a lot more languages than English and Italian. I'm going to leave it there, and hopefully we'll have a big discussion that will... Our discussion in our, in our sort of methodological approaches in our, in our discussion at a more academic level, but it's also come up repeatedly um, in, in the work that we've seen. I'm thinking in the exhibition next door, of course, we have the arabesques indeed of the tiles, we have the, the pattern of the embroidery on, on, on the, the table, on the, uh, you know, the, the, um, the cloth that, that's the, the, the beautiful virtual cloth on the table. And, and of course, the Arabex goes back to, to what Marina was talking about. We heard this morning Maria talking about weaving and texture again, and it came up, of course, in the work of Lucy. And, and interestingly, one of the reasons why I connected B. Amore, whose work is in the exhibition, but she's not here, and, and Lucy's work is because both of them use precisely that image. For, for B, it was the image of the filo rosso della migrazione, and is this image of the gomi of the, the, the thread that was thrown from the ships and that sort of stayed in the air, lingered in the air until it was completely sort of dipanato. Yep, yep, if you're going to. <laughs> and and for, for, you know, for Lucy's this idea, again, of the thread, you know, that, that, that she uses. So I think it really is um, a very powerful, and, and of course what you're talking about, this uh, question, both of you have been talking about the need for collaborative work, for interdisciplinary work, for the weaving of different languages, different right. approaches. So I think it's really also a very powerful methodological uh, tool that we have there. And yes, you can say something about it. I've just been thinking as Loredana is uh, pulling together our thoughts about why the fiber, the textile, the um, you know textured element figures uh, so often on the program, and I, I think uh, I don't. Of course, culture never floats free from the material world. It never completely floats free from our bodies. No form of labor does. But when we talk about texts and when we talk about images, uh, if we take the position of a semiotician or um, a student of media, um, there is a tendency to as we, as we focus on these important elements of human life to um, remove, from, remove from the foreground at least the labor that creates them. And my sense is that we grasp for those embodied forms of labor uh, in order to keep culture tied 
to the very material, um, pragmatic, embodied lives of the people whose minds and subjectivities we want to understand. That said, however, it is both deeply gratifying for me as a textile worker, but also as a female, to notice that we've chosen a form of female labor to ground our thinking about culture, language, and media uh, to the material world. So I don't have an answer for why we've reached towards female work, uh, but as a male I never grew, grew up surrounded by women. Uh, the, when, last night when I walked in, somebody said there was a performance going on. So I walked in to there and I just saw a woman sewing, which was something I was so used to my whole life. Whatever, you know, Uncle Grant and my aunts would sew. In fact, I'm going next week to California to one of my favorite aunts who just sewed me every single thing I ever, I've, I've ever used, I think, that is, is formal. Oh, I want you to have this handkerchief for your confirmation. I want you to have this... And so when I walked in, I'm looking for the performance. And I see Lucy, and I see, well, she's, she's wearing an older dress. And, you know, you know is, is that the performance? And I thought, well, how could sewing, something that I was so used to, seeing all my life, how could that be art? You know, and, 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 and I realized, as soon as I thought that, that it was that separation, that what happened in my home, what happened in school and home had to be kept separate. And that, yes, it was art, but it was work. Because they wouldn't say, shut up, I'm, I'm, or go upstairs and play, I'm, making, I'm, I'm, I'm an artist. I'm being creative, I'm an artist. No, it was, I'm working. Can't you see she's working, don't bother her. And so, to, to see it last, it, was, it just opened my eyes for the, to, to that, you know, that which we can see um, again. And, and outside the, con you know, Sewing in a in an exhibition in, in an ex exhibition space it, it shocked the heck out of me. It was like, okay, where's where's the performance here? And and so, it, it really humbled me to see that and and, and to and, and to go back and think about all the times I took all that art for granted and bothered all those artists to cook me some food. Which I, I suppose makes Lucy's point when she was saying this morning that 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 gesture and that use that she makes of those memories which are very much sort of feminine sort of arts in a sense it is indeed a feminist gesture you, you were saying this this morning in my own way I do that I put it in my performance that's a form of feminism or, or indeed Maria's sort of um, sort of Cite, Maria citing those, those questions, you know, how can a, a, an Italian woman be a feminist? <laughs> okay, um, I think at that point um, we, we should definitely open, open it all up to discussion. We've, we've spoken for far too long, probably, and um, it, it would be great to have your comments, to have your criticisms, to have your further views on where we go from here. I think one thing that I would say is that um, it, all we've been saying is about the importance also of networks and of collaborative um, work, and we are a network here. So there, there, is, there is a very global and very local network in this room. Comments, questions? There is, um, there's probably another mic, yeah, there's a mic by Viviana, so. No, like, no, 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 I'm saying that it can, it can circulate. I'm not, I'm not saying you have to, you know, I'm saying, I'm saying it can circulate. Adalgisa, Viviana, do you mind passing the? There's a, at the very bottom, yeah. It's at the very, at the very bottom. There's a tiny little thing, but at the very bottom, there's a tiny little thingy that you've got to press. Very, very bottom. If not, I'll pass this one around. Yep. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Is it working? 
Okay, just a, a little reflection, and it's not done in any, um, you know, it's done in a very good, positive spirit. When we talk about textiles and um, feminine arts and creativity linked to it, and I mean, it's, it's, there's a long tradition in feminist uh, theory about this. Yes. Um, so we can just think of Nancy Miller's work uh, on arachnologies. Uh, um, so one important element there is to introduce an element of resistance. So I was wondering, where is the resistance? I'm not saying there isn't, or mm. you know, it's not. I'm not asking in any sense saying that there isn't. But I would like, you know, something we should think about, and perhaps, uh, um, you know, um, the, the kind of what you do. Is there an element of resistance of you know pushing towards change about turning maybe these traditional feminine arts into something else, or you know having something more than just reproducing uh, what women have done for centuries? So I'm not saying there should be. I'm just mm -hmm. wondering. I just want to call attention to the fact that what I'm making here, very very boring knitting. It's part of actually a movement that you probably have here as well, although I haven't explored it here, which is called yarn bombing, bombing, where you use the, fem the feminine arts of largely knitting, sometimes crocheting, to take over and to transform public spaces. You cover a bridge, you cover a building, you cover a car with, um, and just transform Again, as a creative act of resistance, no, this isn't necessarily what a car or a bridge or a building has to look like. Here's what it looks like if we impose upon it this form of creativity. Now, is that resistance? Is it going to change the world? I'm not an artist. I actually, I, this is creativity. I think of my work as artisanal rather than artistic because I focus on um, I, I think of it as a form of labor, um, unalienated labor, uh, but I don't know if it changes the world, but most artists think they're changing the world, I think. Ruth, um, I don't know where the other mic has ended up. Oh no, it's with Lucy, so Lucy first and then it will go to Ruth. Yes, sure please. No, why don't, you, why don't you take this one, and I'll, I'll play with that one. Take this one, let's swap, and I'll see if I can turn it up now. I think it's on, is it on now? Yeah. Okay. Um, in response to that, the question about uh, feminism or... No, I've forgotten what the question was. Anyway, I'll, I'll answer what I was thinking in my head anyway. Resistance. Resistance, yes. Resistance to the uh, traditional women's roles. It is, yes. It, I am acknowledging that um, these roles have been traditionally feminine and, you know, at one stage only for women. Um, I also need to say... My... My <laughs> Look, have this one, honestly. Okay, it's back on. It's going. I'm going on and off, a bit like me. Um, <laughs> I also, I also need to acknowledge that um, my exploration of the of the women's uh, crisis. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Uh, censorship. Anyway, um, what was I saying? Yes. So my explore, exploration of women's work um, has really uh, only started me kind of doing this in a performative way since I started doing my master's a couple of years ago. And previous to that I was uh, doing other performative um, Things still inhabiting uh, dressing in, in a feminine, in, reminiscent of my uh, grandmother's and other other artistic um, methods of making art. Um, but recently, um, doing all doing all my artwork, um, what 
I have been conscious of doing is passing on these traditions to my son. I have, I only have, I have one child, and he's a male, obviously, he's my son. Um, but I taught him um, at one of the uh, my first embroidery. Um, residency, I suppose you'd say, how to embroider. I mean, he did his own thing, like I'd say, you know, you can do whatever you like. So he embroidered a car, which was very, you know, masculine, his statement. Um, but passing on those traditions, and um, my mother still makes the traditional Italian wood fried bread, so he's been involved. Uh, with making that with my mother and myself and all the you know traditional women's things um, you know in inverted commas I suppose you'd say and the, and the gender roles that I am uncomfortable with because you know trying to uh, change perceptions of, of things and 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 things like that but I'll leave it at that because I can go on and on So, um, I, I mean, I don't, I, I, it's kind of mal, malforma, this, this question. It's not really, a, I'm just, you know, pondering as I have been this problem of the place of Italian American studies and Italian studies, right? And, and my department at NYU, we were, we, we always had a, a course on literature that was integrated. But it was because we got a um, very nice gift of an endowed chair from an Italian American foundation that went into our department that we were able to institutionalize this, um, this bringing together with this visiting professor. But so, but intellectually, you know, it's 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 difficult, and I, I suppose coming from outside both Italian American and Italian studies as a historian, I was maybe easier for me to to see. Well, this makes no sense, right? Um, so I'm thinking, you know, what where are the points that we can press to 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 help with this situation? And I mean, one is just trying to get trying to raise money for people to give dedicated you know chairs or visiting chairs which are cheaper by the way um, or lecture series or things that that people Italian wealthy Italian Americans and I'm saying Americans but it can be in any of the places where Italians have been Canada Australia they they will give um, for that and that's one way to kind of ease it in and show that there's a constituency for it. This is a very practical observation. But then I think, you know, where what kind of subjects? It's almost like the second that Italians leave and they go and they arrive in Ellis Island, it becomes American studies, which is why you, you're in, you know, an English department or it doesn't have a home, right? So, you know, we have to also maybe be activist and teach in a different way. So reverse migration, for example, I had no, again, I came from a, really a position of pretty, a lot of ignorance about the subject. I had no idea that there was so much reverse migration. But if you consider that one fact, which is backed up by so much data, then we're not talking about, it's a different continuum and a different history, and then it makes total sense to keep it inside Italian studies or to put it in there. So I guess we could, we could engage in thinking about the, the kind of nodes or how to reconceptualize or argue through maybe having events where we t talk about, I, I talked about this with Anthony and the Calandra. I don't know, have events in our respective of places to, to sensitize people to this because it's hard to it's hard to have curricular change and institutional change so that's all just throwing out these ideas yes I'm, I'm just going to pass it on to to Christina but to say that that seems to me fundamental and it's not just even about Italian studies but in that sense and that's where for me the weaving also goes to precisely the weaving of cultures and of languages. And I, I like, by the way, the, the metaphor of weaving because of the trama and the ordito, because you have more elements, more than one element coming to, coming together. It's not just, uh, so I, I, and I think that precisely the, the continuing to note how culture does not stay still and how, for instance, um, I, I do this all the time when talking about migration, but also when talking about translation, they're not processes that simply go from A to B and there they stand still. They're processes that continue to be productive and continue to complicate, but also to, to form the texture of our lives um, very intricately. And so 
working in that direction, trying to build this um, into our curricula. Maybe, you know, and some of our colleagues may hate us because we complicate lives, but life's complicated in that sense. Christina. Can I just, uh, just, yeah. Another thing is to, that I want as an First of all, as I hear uh, Donna and Fred talking, it seems to me that we are, and that's one of my concerns lately, we know exactly what Italian means, and know, we know what Italian-American means as a consequence, and that disturbs me a little bit, because I think we all have a myth of origins. I mean, we all certainly seem to know what it means to be Italian, or to be Italian-American, and this bothers me a little bit, also in terms of institutional practices. For instance, my university, Loyola University uh, Chicago, which is a Jesuit school, is in fact has done exactly what uh, NYU has done, meaning raising money, funds, for, to create an endowed chair in Italian-American studies. Now, the money comes from the Italian-American community. The Italian-American community in Chicago is fairly conservative. There seems to be, they know exactly, seems to know what it means to be Italian-American. And the, the way in which I think the direction of this institutional chairship is going is to re uh, institutionalized modes of Italianness that are extremely exclusive. They are, in fact, very much Catholic. They're very much geared around certain modality of traditions that are folkloric and they have uh, certainly, uh, you know, um, beautiful material practices, I don't want to put them down, that have to do with, you know, patron saint celebrations and nothing against it. But I think that if we do reify italian Americanness and Italianness that way, and we bring it back into Italian studies programs without opening the idea of what Italianness means, we, we end, we're going to end up reproducing islands of sameness that have no, no sense of the diversity of what being Italian means in the 21st century, with the exclusion of many new Italians, new ways of being Italian that um, are becoming, I think, even more invisible in Italian studies than before. I suppose, it, I'll, I'll pass it back to Fred, but again, I suppose that, that's partly it's the other side of the anxiety that I was talking about at the beginning when I was saying the last thing we want to do is to sort of reiterate some kind of greater Italy of, of you know, to Grande Italia discourse in which uh, there, there is, a, there is a, you know, there is a, this kind of myth of Italian culture traveling around the world in, in that exclusivist way. And equally, you know, if we have to conceptualize it as, as very specific and very folkloric, as you say, that that's not what we want to do. But there, presumably, is there, it's precisely where we're trying to work with different paradigms to, to break that kind of binary. Just briefly, I've been involved in every chair in Italian-American studies that has been created. And almost all of them, except for the one, well, almost all of them have gone to Italianists. I'm, I'm the first person to be in a chair that is, you know, and, and my, myself and and, um, and Phil, kind of stir on my buddy Phil, um, who are Italian-Americanists in a sense. Actually, Phil was more of a historian of Italian. Started in Italian, but began. But what happened was the Italian-Americans have no idea what Italian, I mean, they think they're Italian. And so when, when they give the money, which they're more than willing to give, to a department, and the department uses it for a music scholar or historian, an Italian historian, or an Italian, in case like Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, an Italian literature scholar. The Italian community thinks that they're getting something that they're not. They're getting what you precisely what you said, which is a traditional scholar in a field that is very is basically open to Italian-American studies for public reasons, not, not for professional reasons. Uh, just to show the public, yes, we do this. And, and they don't even know whether or not they should be disappointed. <laughs> so you just say, well, we gave the money, this is, and so, but, but what has to happen is we have to bomb uh, both Italian studies and American studies with these notions of these Italian diaspora studies. If we change the fields, the person who comes in as a chair, well, you know, they, you know I, I, I'm not worried about Chicago. Chicago, you're right, is very conservative, and so on, but I don't think they have <clears throat> the mindset to be able to 
number one, articulate what it is they're looking for, and number two, demand it, especially with the Jesuits. I've actually stayed away from the institutionalization of the field for a number of reasons that have to do with uh, your comment, and I'm thrilled that Fred is fighting the good fight. It's not a fight that I ever particularly wanted to fight, but I can make a statement having written about Italy's diasporas, right? Um, one encounters a terrible problem of language, and I have had multiple battles with both my publishers and my editors about trying to avoid the use of the adjective Italian to describe um, phenomena, cultural and uh, demographic, uh, during parts of the past, or for that matter, the present, where I don't think it's unproblematic uh, or you know, kind of accepted what Italian means. But it's a problem of language. And you can only say the workers of Italy, the migrants of Italy, the something originating in Italy so many times before your copy editor goes berserk and says, it's very similar to the problem one faces when one writes about the United States for an audience or readership outside the US, the, the, the unavoidable adjective American. You're an American historian. And when I was briefly uh, in a position which was called border crossing history at the University of Pittsburgh, I tried to introduce the concept of being a US-ist. <laughs> and it's an ugly word. Uh, it didn't spread. And I'm not surprised, but it is partially a problem of the nationalization of the both scholarly and vernacular languages that we can use, no matter what language we're speaking. Can I go back, though, very quickly to something that Ruth, I think, said at the very start, or maybe it was even someone else. I can't remember now any longer who said it, but that, I think it was Ruth, that we can't have the transnational without national. And I think it's a misunderstanding, in a sense, also that, this, that, that at times I certainly encounter where people say, well, then you want to abolish Italian studies as such, or you want to abolish French studies, or you want to abolish... No. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I want to abolish anything. Personally, I don't want to abolish anything, anything I think. But it's, it's, it's also misunderstanding in a sense, and, and it's, it goes back to that problem of language. What are we, what are we labeling every time? And it goes back to the labels, and what are we labeling every time that we're using this? Yes, I know. Maura. Maura, as you've been relabeled <laughs> throughout this. First, I guess on behalf of everybody, I want to thank all of the organizers, um, because I, I think we've all had a really um, wonderful experience here for three days. Um, and I'm sorry if I usurped anybody's role who should have done that, but um, I felt like we might want to do that. Um, one of the things that I did want to ask or sort of suggest or somewhere go there is um, a lot of the discourse is about mobility. The panel we did was about immobility and transnationalism in immobility. And, and I just wanted to know where there might be a a ability to carve out a space there, or if maybe we're talking about something different, or we need to define transnationalism in a different way, or, or, or define it. And that's a, a broad question I'm, I'm asking. Yes, I think in, in that sense, you know, sometimes you don't move, but the borders move, or, or other things move, or, yeah, yes, yeah. There is a, there is that very, there is a stunningly beautiful, um, uh, it's not even a short story, but a piece by Fabrizia Ramondino, in which she talks about the journey that this old lady makes all the way to the Café Mexico in Naples, and, and she says that journey for that lady was bigger than any journey I've done around the globe. So it, it's relative that, that, that the mobility issue is... mobilities, uh, as with globalization theory, which emerged almost simultaneously uh, in cultural studies uh, in kind of neoliberal economics and in sociology, I mean, it like, and in anthropology kind of sprang up all there in the early 90s. Um, there is a number of fonts of theorization for mobility studies, and at least one of those, which comes out of um, 
is it Lancaster, I think? Uh, so, so, yeah, John Uri, uh, Mimi Scheller, uh, the, the uh, Tim Cresswell. So yeah, it comes out of Lancaster, I think. And, and for them, um, they're interested in mobility studies in order to understand how mobility and immobility are always mutually constitutive. And it, that's a hard thing to study. Uh, for an historian, actually, uh, unless one focuses on borders, where I think you see that happen. But f at least for some theorizations, you don't get mobility without immobility as a um, sort of an epistemological almost challenge. Martino. No, I, I would invite the, the room just briefly spare a, a thought about the condition of this kind of studies and transnational studies in Italy. Because uh, there's no one here in the room other than myself and I think Caterina who are engaged, uh, who, are engaged who are professionally uh, working in, in a field which happens to be called Italian style, in Italiano, no? Come si chiama? Italianiste, qualcosa del genere, so. Which has at least now three fastidiously uh, diverse, uh, different uh, bureaucratic uh, categories uh, for the national searches and all that. And you, you're probably all aware of this, but there's no way that the national, not transnational, super hyper-national uh, academic system in Italy would even think of recognizing, I'm not saying Italian-American literature or migrant literature, but the history of migration, the social, not, not even sociologists have a, a, th a feel like that. Um, you know, so maybe help us out. <laughs> <laughs> there's no, there's no, there's not even a, uh, a hint of that even being even remotely possible. So, uh, you know, and um, I find it even tedious to bring this up, tiresome, personally. Uh, it's just a matter, now I'm thinking at this point of, of my students, you know. Uh, when I propose uh, dissertations on the Italian-German, uh, German-Italian literature, French-Italian literature, which can boast uh, masterpieces. Who cares about boasting species? But they also have masterpieces. I go to my French colleagues. Uh, I mean, French is easy. They are, what are you talking about? What do? What should we do this? Uh, this thing. Um, and I, I don't even go anymore to my Itali Italianist colleagues. Uh, it's, no, I, I go to. I'd rather go to New York, uh, Tirasegno, and uh, and and I gladly do that. Uh, somewhere else, but uh, this is the situation here. And I'm not only talking about cultural studies, but again, uh, the first person I tried to, uh, to talk about this uh, was uh, Matteo Sanfilippo a few months ago, and I said, well, Matteo, what's going on? And he's a foremost historian, and, you know, I, and he told me, you know, I, I've long, uh, I've long uh, given up on this, you know. Well, there is there is a summer school, amongst other things. So there is there is a summer school. Uh, Mike Chiarato created a center for Italian American French, which is really Italian diaspora studies. Okay, I just want to make a very uh, short comment on this last uh, intervention, Martino, because I think that we can we have been talking for a very long time about. I mean, so many academics in Italy can com complain, sorry, about the situation of, about, uh, of the Italian academic system, about how stuck it is. But I think that, I don't know what is your position, but I think that the debate that we are having in these very days about the 500 uh, positions that the uh, that Renzi wants to impose by commissioning um, uh, by, by creating this international commission and select 500 new academics that would enter the Italian academic system um, is, I mean, just, just shows the, the point uh, to which we are now. I think that 
it's very disappointing sometimes to see the reaction that Italian academics are having against this um, decision of the government because I understand that this is a very problematic um, measure but at the same time I think that uh, the debate that has started within the Italian academia should connect much more with uh, Italian academics that are abroad and trying to um, include um, different point of views on the situation. So this is just... And I, I just want to say to that, the reason I get so much play in Italy these days is because of a dictum that has come down to the universities, which is called internationalization. Yes. Now, they can't define that. They don't know what it is. But they know when they bring me from America, they can say, oh, look, we're internationalized. And if I can get in any way I can get across those borders, I'll, I'll come in. But every university, Calabria, for example, created this program, CLIA, uh, in Italian American Studies, precisely to fulfill that mandate. So there is an internationalization mandate, and everybody loves, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of the administrators love to come to New York. And so they will be happy to use their money to come and sign agreements. We have more agreements with, with schools than we even have students from. <laughs> Well, I think you know it, what, what Fred is saying is is very important because whilst we you know we can complain, I'm sure, for, well, you know. <laughs> but um, but it is interesting that if if you know if we look around this room and if we look at the past three days again, you know, I want to, to end in a sense where we started. There's been an incredible buzz and there is incredibly exciting work that is being done, and there are lots and lots of spaces that are being found for precisely pushing those boundaries and 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 indeed looking at mobilities and immobilities and and all those different notions and also how they can take us out of our. Uh, institutions and and into dialogues with um, with with lots of people with you know with, with 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 artists with curators with writers with journalists with people you know with whom whether it is the real world or not but people with whom we can continue to interact and I think it seems to me that there's an awful lot of that which is going on um, and and that through those textures if we continue to to weave those networks we we we're most probably going in the right direction. Um, sort of, there is resistance in all kinds of, that, of, of, of ways. But I also think, I, I will give the mic back to Christina, but I also think that um, you know, on, on the very first day, and they weren't in this room at the time, but I, thank, I thanked Julia and Viviana for having pushed us um, to think in different ways about our work. And then I think it was Julia of the two who said, you know, because we also wanted to look at the ricercatore as an oggetto. And, I, and I've, been, I've, I've been thinking of myself, yeah, so I'm no longer a donna oggetto, I'm a ricercatore oggetto. But, but there, is a, there is a deeper sense in that, in that if we want to have some answers to some of the questions that have come up here, we also have to be very deeply critical about our own positions and, and about what we're doing. And it seems to me that, that I've had an inordinate amount of a very positive, very constructive critical positioning over the past few days. Christina. Then we'll stop it. Uh, I, no, I, I, I totally agree with Martino. Though. So we are in the position, we Italianisti d'Italia, right? we can say Italy in this sense, like me, for instance. We are in the positions you were when you were knocking at the doors of American studies and saying, let us in. Okay, if I want to return to Italy and teach in Italian institutions, I've, I've tried, and they tell me you left. There's no space for you here. Okay? I'm a mobile scholar who has left and sort of betrayed la madre patria all right well, really seriously i mean the problem is italy i mean there is no space for scholars who do the work we do on transnational italy it's in italian institution in italianistica so i mean i love you know this is a great wonderful moment of uh, encounter among researchers but with european funds I mean, and all of the scholars and, and that I see here are Italians who went to the UK to study what they're studying. They're not studying in Italy. I mean, this is really the reality, going back to the materiality of what we do. This is the reality. There's no space for in Italian academia for what we do. In Italy. Not just in Italian studies. Charles, stop us at some point. I would like to recall 
due cose che hanno detto eh, Donna e Fred che secondo me sono molto importanti una è la collaborazione però per fare veramente un progetto collaborativo eh, che, che riesca ci vuole un, un un'articolazione precisa, ci vuole un focus preciso e nel, nel tuo caso tu hai scelto il eh, movimento operaio e quindi eh, eh, c'erano un, un numero di studiosi e di studiose che si sono concentrate su quello e che sono arrivate da tutte le parti del mondo per studiare il movimento operaio in un modo e hai avuto successo. Cioè, ecco, quello è il problema, è il problema secondo me che vedo anche un po' in questo, in questo bellissimo convegno, è la mancanza di specificità. Cioè, per tanti anni noi eh, abbiamo parlato e continuiamo a parlare di, di programmi interdisciplinari, corriamo il rischio di perdere la specificità disciplinare, e come italianisti, come specialisti di film studies, e come storici, eccetera, eccetera. E quello è un problema. Secondo problema, e non è un caso che io stia facendo l'intervento in italiano, è quello che Fred diceva sulla lingua. E noi, se noi eh, perdiamo di nuovo il focus sulla lingua, la battaglia, ma non è una battaglia, è sempre, perché non è una battaglia per mantenere un posto di lavoro, è, è un favore che noi facciamo agli studenti, perché se loro non apprendono la lingua straniera, non riescono ad aprirsi mentalmente, non possiamo parlare di come un, un autore come Amara Lacus usa il dialetto, perché lui si è fatto un mazzo così per dieci anni per imparare la lingua. E, 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 cioè, quindi quelle due cose sono importanti, la specificità del progetto e il lavoro sulla lingua. E per fare quello bisogna farsi un mazzo così. <ride> Indubbiamente, no, sulla, sulla, sulla lingua it's, it's an open door, nel senso che assolutamente è per, per di nuovo l'importanza del lavoro di non scollare mai eh, da un lato, eh, e, e come, come, come specialista in translation studies, that, you know, my face is out there, assolutamente, eh, il fatto che per esempio la, la traduzione possa diventare puramente una metafora e quindi il lavoro sulla lingua poi scompaia, la traduzione che sia visibile o che sia invisibile, come ci, ci faceva vedere, a volte ehm, Goffredo stamattina, ma la traduzione è un fatto linguistico per cominciare. Sulla specificità credo che è un rischio che stiamo scegliendo di avere un tempo. Yes, in whichever order. Just very, just very briefly, um, the uh, class conscious search for a diaspora or a, you know, a Italian international proletariat was very specific, but it was the beginning of a sequence of further collaborations from uh, class conscious uh, radicals worldwide, anarchist, socialist, and communist, and anti-fascist. Then uh, we morphed into a second collaboration on gender and women, a third collaboration on um, the diasporic private sphere with uh, Loretta Baldessar, and uh, a much a much less well-known collaboration, perhaps because it was published in French rather than in English, was a look at little Italys around the world, uh, undertaken by my, my one collaborator that I didn't name, and that was uh, Marie-Claude Blanchelliard. So it, it, when you think about focus, I recommend sequencing. Yeah. Very good, yeah. and, and I also recommend moving into other disciplines, not, not interdisciplinary, but multidisciplinary. You have to be, and this is why it's been so hard and so long to, to be an Italian-Americanist, because I first became an Americanist, then I had to be in some sense an Italianist in order to be able to get it. And the next project that I'm working on, and maybe you can help me by pointing writers in my direction, is I want to do an anthology. I mean, there is a literary, a poetic anthology of Italian poetry from out the world. It's so big. Uh, Luigi Bonafini just published it. But I would like to do an anthology of fiction, nonfiction, drama, uh, maybe different volumes. And I, you know, now 
you know, as opposed to when I was young and foolish, I didn't have a series, I have a series. Uh, SUNY Press, and we also have a press board to get a press. So if you know, I'm going to put the call out in, in the spring for, for an international anthology of Italian-American writing. We'll do the short story first and then go on to other things. Because I think only when you do bring these points of focus in, uh, and then eventually, hopefully, we'll get books on return narratives, uh, re narratives of return. Because that, everybody returns to some place, maybe, or maybe they don't, who knows. Okay, on that note, and having taken far too much time, and yes, on that image of, you know, how you, you focus by sequencing, and of course the sequence is not linear either, so I've, I think, again, a word I've heard a number of times um, during this conference is, is a reference to Benjamin's image of the constellation, and I think on that constellation, we'll close it, and what is happening next? Are we going straight into the final discussion? Okay, we have a few minutes. And thank you again to Fred and to Donna with us.